coming. Uh, friends, we are starting. As a, today is the 183rd Friday group meeting. The speaker is uh, Balbir Singh, the senior advocate and present ASG of Government of India. The topic is part one. There's a constitutional para uh, framework on tax that will be the 20 minutes. Part two, equalize levy tax and gambling that will be 10, 20 minutes. So we divide in two parts, sir, divided into two. A plus minus you can make sir, yes, yes, whatever way. I think if it in between yeah. also if anybody has a question you can yeah, stop. No, last we have a, last that. we have a uh, All right. okay. Yeah, okay. part one after that immediately we can have a question, part two sir of end of this thing we can have a right, right. Now you can initiate your uh, lecture, sir. Just right. one second. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay. will give you a CV. She is uh, another young member from our uh, Friday group. She is also from luckily Rajasthan. Sir, also from Rajasthan. <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> Please, you can carry this. If I may, sir. Yeah, please. Thank you. Today we have amongst us Mr. Balbir Singh, who is one of the youngest senior counsels in India. He was designated by Delhi High Court in 20, May 2015 at the age of 42 years as a senior counsel. Sir has extensive experience of 18 years at the bar, practicing in various high courts and the Supreme Court of India. Sir focuses on corporate and commercial, tax, trade, antitrust, technology and regulatory litigation. He has experience of participating and representing in various domestic and international dispute resolution proceedings before the arbitral tribunals. Sir has also represented the Income Tax Department and Competition Commission of India in leading cases of treaty disputes, transfer pricing, cartel, abuse of dominance, etc. And his expertise on these subjects is his strength besides knowledge of law. Sir has also contributed to various articles in leading journals on Indian legal and le uh, regulatory environment, Indian judicial system and impact of Indian regulatory environment on FDI that is foreign direct investment. Sir has al also delivered various lectures at institutes of repute and sir we are very happy to have you have you here and we are all yours to whatever you have to say. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much sir. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, please. Uh, first of all, I think thank you everyone for having me here and uh, thank you Mr. Rao for giving me this opportunity to come. And Shridhar, some credit goes to you also that the, he introduced me to this uh, forum and uh, honestly I had not chances to see multiple videos but after I met him I realized that the, uh, the kind of individuals or practitioners who have been participating in this is I am absolutely honoured uh, to be part of it, uh, this kind of a group and uh, to share whatever little I know about that. Um, as I said earlier, I think I am very surprised on Friday afternoon the, you want to hear about a gambling which you gamble every day in the court. So, and especially on Monday, Fridays, that's what the, I think the other day we were debating in a court that Mr. Sibbal said that somebody asked what the meaning of gambling. He said that what we do on Monday, Friday, same, my lords. <laughs> so, it's no different uh, from that, the toss of a coin. But I think broader framework first, if I say, most of the, you may have dealt in one way or the other at some stage. But broadly, for understanding purposes, if we see our constitution, uh, because we have a federal structure where the states live on their own and some part of the revenues from the state for the state are shared by the centre government. Primarily, the uh, so far as the source of law is concerned, it comes from the constitution where the legislative making process is given. And the fields which are given are given the entries and primarily if we look, at, look for the entries uh, for taxation are in list 1 and list 2. List 1 primarily are all you know the central government and the major source of tax for the central government is the uh, income tax and if we look two three entries beside the income tax which may be relevant our central excise used to be there it is still there but i'll speak about the post gst there is a, some dramatic shift in that we have a customs which is there so if we trace back the field we go back to list 82 83 and 84 and 84 uh, uh, 82 is income tax and 84 when we look at the uh, excise. Similarly, if we look at the list 2 where the state has got the power. So, state is being a federal, they have a power. Largely, the source of revenue used to be sales tax. Then they have entertainment tax. So, similarly, uh, like the list 1, list 2 has got entries which are 
which have been interpreted number of times by the courts. Uh, coming to first the settled government uh, income tax which we see uh, beside the, this is the structure being there. Uh, legislative process which is there in the is in part 11 and chapter 1 which deals with 246 to 253 articles which are broadly gives the power of the legislative making making process which is given and 246 specifically where the division is given that 246 one says that settled government under uh, article sub article 1 has got the power which is exclusive given to parliament list 1 list 2 in, in sub, sub article 2 the state government similarly you have seen this process broadly you know Coming to specifically the subject, we have the 1961 Act, which is there. So, coming specifically to the law per se, we have this Act of 1961. And if we look at 1961 Act primarily, uh, that's what provides the whole machinery, whole setup, whole chargeability, the every mechanism required for levy and collection of income tax on multiple transactions. I remember Palkiwala used to say in all these lectures after every budget in Bobon Stadium in Bombay, said that the uh, tax law particularly is experience for taxpayers which is equivalent to uh, experience of life for ordinary citizen or on ordinary individuals. And that is the uh, tumultuous, that is like a roller coaster because we keep seeing so many changes every year in tax law that is very difficult to comprehend that ultimately the ordinary man, how they experience this is the taxpayer similarly experience the uh, tax law over a period of time. I was trying to trace back that when 1961 this act was made, prior to that we had a 1922 act. And Muraji Desai was the finance minister when he presented this bill in 1961 in the, in the, uh, uh, in the Rajya Sabha. Interestingly, that was sent to the standing committee of 30 members at that point in time. The uh, aims and object clause of this act says that we had 1922 act, which was, which was reshuffled in 1939. From 1939 to 1956, we had 27 amendments, so which complicated a lot and therefore we need to simplify and as a result a committee was appointed to give them that the, the task of simplifying it because if you have made 27 or 28 amendment from 39 to 1956, it was considered very complex and ordinary people can't understand. Now this 1961 act till today had more than 10,000 amendments. So if we look at the very object which was achieved and if we see the debate of uh, a parliamentary debate of that time, some members objected to it when this the uh, it was presented in the, uh, in the first in the Rajya Sabha. So this was discussed at that point in time that these are different clauses, why we have got it. Some members specifically said that, they said that we don't think you will be able to achieve the simplicity you are looking for or the objectivity you are looking for by essentially making a reason that there were 29 amendments and therefore it got very complicated. And that's what we have heard over a period of time since 1961. 10,000 amendments in any act, can you imagine that somebody can track down? And I have a very interesting instance, I think I had gone to brief Soli Sorabji at one point in time. So I said, please look at uh, section 1034, ninth proviso. He said, what do you mean? You mean to say the one provision has got 34 provisions and then you have the 34th subsection, you have nine provisos. I said, yes sir, the ninth proviso. He said, is the proviso to proviso or a standalone proviso? So he took time, I mean people of that stature said that if why this law has been made so complicated, uh, we can't understand. And I think the same is the complaint today we hear from judges that how do we, how do you expect us to keep track of all this? How do you expect as, the, as a final court of the country to interpret this provisos after provisos, notwithstanding this clause read with that clause? So it's a fairly complex law, that's what my experience over a period of time has been done. It has been tried by Government of India, I think it's best at different levels that to simplify it. You know, with the changing economic scenarios, I think the uh, government is not able to reach a point that they can have a standing act which is not amended at any point in time. But the areas like Section 10, particularly if I talk of, is area which says the income which is not to be included in the total income on which the tax is to be charged. So therefore, 
there are certain types of incomes like education, charitable, so on and so forth, some banking incomes, and not to be included in the income. Now, there are 50 entries in that. So, means there are 50 types of assessees which are to be identified and each clause has multiple provisos. And each year there is a some change in this. So, keep track of that itself become a very difficult exercise for anyone. And this has shaped in a very, very different dimension over a period of time. But coming to the broad structure, uh, there are five heads of income uh, under the Income Tax Act. And those five broad heads are salary, uh, business, uh, capital gains, income from other sources, uh, and uh, income from house property. There used to be sixth head in 1988 with income from securities has been taken away. So most of the provisions are inbuilt around these five heads which have been created over a period of time. Now then we have a finance act every year. Now interestingly, and this has been litigated for a long time, the finance act changes the rate every year whether it can bring in a new provision, which is a charging provision, can it bring with a new exemption, which has been used to be litigated for a very long time. In somewhere in 1957 or 58, uh, this came to Supreme Court, this debate went on saying that under the constitution, if the finance acts are coming every year, are there different statute or extension of income tax because they used to impose surcharge, they imposed additional tax. So if income tax is exempt, the uh, surcharge is exempt or not, these kind of disputes were used to be there. Court, after looking at everything, said that no, the, the so far as the field of legislation is concerned, the power is driven from the entry 82 itself and therefore it's a part of income tax. So it is not important that the rate should be prescribed every year in the Income Tax Act itself. It can be priced, prescribed to the Finance Act itself. And interestingly, if we see that this tool of Finance Act has been used not only for changing rates every year, but I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the service tax, which was introduced for the first time in 1994 on a standalone provision by the Finance Act. Though no separate law was incorporated for that, no statute was incorporated for that. And that lived till GST today, that Finance Act was used to say that a particular chargeability on a, a separate instance of service is to be taxed and there was no legislative exercise of 246A was carried out through a Finance Act parliamentary mm -hmm. process using Entry 82, this was done. And that lived through the challenge. It came to this Honourable Court that what, how do you draw power without creating a, a separate legislation for charging this? Court said the Entry 87 list 1 is a generic entry, it's the panacea for all the problems and therefore entry 97 gives the power and that's sustained on that basis. So if you look at the taxability, how the courts have over a period of time looked at is the one we all know there is a presumption in favour of constitutionality. But these are very intrinsic areas of constitutional provision which have been looked to uphold these kind of challenges which have come over a period of time. Looking at all this the way this kind of a structure exists, I can tell you that no tax lawyer is going to be out of work for a very long time. And especially after one more fundamental change in the constitution I point out. And that is, now this was morely broadly on the uh, income tax or we call a direct tax side. One more area first before I come to the indirect tax side is, over a period of time, to trace or to charge a, a tax on something, you need to find some basis or some nexus to, to the income. Initially, the focus was the residency test is enough. So, if you are a resident and you are earning income, please pay your taxes. Then, question arose that the farmers who come here for some time, they work here, foreign companies come here, they work for some time, they earn money and they go back, what do you do it? Then they said, alright, we apply the source-based test. Then the, over, the law was amended accordingly, source-based test, because we have a lot of deeming fiction in the Income Tax Act. Then question came that if the income or rather the asset, like a typical Vodafone example, the underlying company was in India, shareholding was owned by a company outside India, so transaction happened outside India itself, nothing was happening in India, but as a result the ownership changed indirectly of the Indian entity changed at some point in time. We saw in a Vodafone after that retrospective amendment was made, but the, sh the major shift which was made that if the underlying asset is being transferred and transferred at any space which results into a transfer of ownership that gives a rise to a transfer of asset and a capital gain to be charged. So the concept of deemed to accrue or arise in India was expanded to say that 
whether there is any source located in India, whether residency located in India, but if there is a change in the hand of assets by virtue of explanation added in section 9, so the another source was created and those eventualities also the taxability can be sustained in India over a period of time it has been done. I think when we talk of the equalized levy in the second part, the significance of that will come that today the uh, all of you, let's say you buy something from Amazon and Amazon is shipping those goods from outside India and delivering to you in India. You are making payment to uh, uh, to Amazon. Now Amazon has no presence in India. The goods have been delivered. Those are foreign goods. But how the government of India can charge, that's where the concept to equalize. So the, what I'm trying to say is that over a period of time, as the the boundaries have evaporated by virtue of technological and man and human resource movement. Every country for that matter wants to expand their the, uh, the, the tax base and want to have maximized the tax gains out of it. And India is no different in that. I remember there is a very famous book by Thomas Friedman, The World Has Become Flat, uh, which means that today there are no boundaries, capital and human resources can travel all across. But I think recently has written a second book after 17 years saying that it is not flat as it used to be because of protectionist measures you see today that everybody has started imposing barriers for the money transfers to the human transfer, visas and multiple other issues which are there. Uh, but the aim and object of all these tools are that if any income or money is out of India is, uh, is from India is going outside India that money must be taxed in India. That's a broader concept. So therefore, income which is from one way or the other is arising is a source. It's to be taxed in India. That's the essence which has been there. Just digressing from this, coming to the constitutional structure of indirect taxes, which is a federal structure. This too, in essence, is the what we need to look at. And uh, this has also been a great source of So now we talk of the constitutional structure in case of indirect taxes. Primarily our focus should be on, on list two. That's where the states in a federal scheme, they get power to uh, levy or impose taxes on the transactions which are there. Broadly, if we talk of the sales tax used to be in domain of the mm -hmm. state authorities, except the interstate sale was the power was given to the central government. A uh, one big change which uh, arose in 2007 for which the 101st amendment was made, the, that was made in September of uh, 2009, a constitutional amendment. Two major things happened there. <coughs> the entries which was existing in list one for service tax, for excise, those were modified and only for six items, those powers were left to the union government to charge central excise duty primarily because we have a central excise act separately, which is 1944 act. Similarly, in the state list, power, the entries pertaining to entertainment tax, to sales tax, barring those six items, those were modified and taken away. And a parallel amendment was made in the legislative competence entries, which were uh, in the articles, which were article 246. A new uh, uh, article was added, 246A. And the concept of the sale concept of manufacture which we have grown up hearing that the, the chargeability arise out of these incidents based on which the taxability arise was shifted. So today whether manufactured or not, whether say, sold or not is irrelevant and it is only a concept of supply which has been added by virtue of article 246A which means that if there is any incidence of supply there is a taxability uh, or chargeability on that particular, whether those are goods or services. If we closely look at Article 246A, there are two, first two sub-articles are extremely important and that's a major shift. The first article says that so far as supply of goods and services are concerned, <coughs> a concurrent power is given to the state and the central government. Earlier, for goods, the manufacturer was in the central kitty. For the sale, it used to be in, in states kitty. And for services, comprehensively under the central government regime through the entry 97 service tax, which was there. So on these two aspects of supply of goods and services, concurrent powers are given. Now the concurrent power, interestingly, is that 
resulted into formulation of two laws for the same very transaction of supply. And today, I don't know if how many people you see, if you pick up any invoice or a bill from the market, you will find on the same invoice, there is a tax which is called CGST, central CGST and the state CGST, which is equivalent amount. If a rate is 18%, you'll find 9 and 9%. This never used to happen on the same transaction. You can charge half an un tax on the both of the entries. Like in manufacture, state never used to charge. In a service tax, state never used to charge. Or sales tax, <coughs> the state used to charge, but central government never used to be charged. So this is the one major shift which has happened in the case of supply. And interestingly, Article 246A starts with notwithstanding 246, which usually used to be the usual source for uh, legislating in case of uh, uh, the entries given in for the parliament. So that's a big change which is there. Now, 246A2 says that so far as the interstate transactions are concerned, the transaction of supply, this power is exclusively given to the uh, to the central government, which means the state can't make it. This is parallel to the Central Sales Tax 1956 Act we used to have, although the power of collection was given to the state government, but levy was with the central government, although the machinery of state government was to be used under that system. So this is the one major change which has done. Another more as important aspect is that the, the aspect of repugnancy, the aspect of conflict, the aspect of uh, uh, already captured field, those things have gone today. There is no tiebreaker rule which we used to say that the, in the earlier, if we see the case law that the, if somebody is in the state's domain, center can't do it. So rules were very clear. And this recently we argued last this week itself a case where we the court asked us that what happened in case of a dispute between the central and state government over a particular transaction? What do you do in that case? This mechanism of indirect taxes has been very well thought through. That's And it took almost, if we look at the start, it started, the idea started in 2004. The first bill was presented sometime in 2010 but it was never passed and thereafter in effectively in 2016 this took some shape and idea on this so what the differential mechanism has been created is a constitutional body in the name of gst council has been created which give participation to the central government and state government and a voting right to the extent of two third and one third so one third with the central government and two third they give recommendation that what taxes you should charge what the rate of taxes should be what should be effective mechanism? So this is a more democratic, collective uh, decision-making process for enforcing a law which has been uh, made by the central government or the state government in terms of Article 246A. Broadly, if we see till now, the meetings have happened, the GST Council meetings have happened with the participation of state government. Broadly, things have shaped well. We have not seen too many disputes so far as the state or center conflict is concerned or repugnancy is concerned. We have not seen till now as well, except that why all the states agreed to this kind of a federal or a cooperative federal structure was that a theory of compensation was propagated in the whole scheme which means that if one state is losing some money but the other state is gaining more let's say that the ultimately maximum sales are in state of Maharashtra but the origination is in state of Bihar Maharashtra is going to earn more and Bihar is going to earn less so the some kind of a mechanism was devised by based on which the council was given power that the compensation can be given to the to the states which are losing revenue and some kind of a protection in terms of uh, annual growth of 14 percent year on year basis was, was agreed to all the states we had a COVID time so therefore this could not be met and therefore some disputes are going on some states are complaining we have not been compensated to agreed formula those issues are going on but as on today there is not a single matter where there is a conflict between any particular state with the center or two states among themselves have resulted to reach the court. But we do not have rightly the guidelines which used to be available earlier in case of a tiebreaker, what the principles you do you apply in case of repugnancy or capture field or so that's where if you look at the particular article 279A by virtue of which this machinery in the name of the uh, GST council has been created, enormous powers have been given to it. But if a dispute is not agreed by two states or a recommendation is not agreed by two states, now what do you do in that case? I believe at some stage this is going to land up in the in, in the court at, and court need to agree, ultimately need to see that how do we deal this part. Now that's on the, the constitutional framework broadly in case of indirect taxes which is available and which is to be seen that how it shape up over a period of time. 
there are some interesting disputes although the one judgment is reserved in sridhar and myself we are on the two sides i would have otherwise discussed that but let's wait for the judgment to come out so broadly this in for i think in a short time this watch i can tell about the uh, uh, about the constitutional scheme for direct and indirect taxes now coming to two other aspects which are there one is on tax on gambling and this is very interesting that if you see gambling is there in the state list entry 34 which betting and gambling is given which mean that the state can legislate in relation to uh, betting and gambling any law can be there like we had initially started 1949 the uh, madras gambling act or public gambling act used to have 1867 those used to be there but there used to be a parallel entry of entertainment tax in entry 62 where the betting and gambling were included which mean on a betting and gambling state had power to impose tax with this new gst system which has come in this entry has been shelved and as a result the today that power to tax power to the legislative entry still exist uh, in in case of ordinary law as you know understand the list is split between two parts the legislative and the taxing entries are kept separate so taxing entries had has been taken away by virtue of this 101st amendment uh, of 2016 parallelly the gst laws which have been framed for the central government which is cgst and state government with the sgst they have come up with a list or rather schedule 3 which specifically says that the transactions enumerated therein would neither be considered a supply of goods or services and one of the entry there says actionable claim minus betting and gambling so if it is actionable claim it is neither a good nor services but betting and gambling has been shifted so this created a big furor as as on I mean, i'm sure you see on a mobile you have these cricket participation games which are there online rummy there uh, online betting there in the multiple games the i think the famous dhoni uh, who's a uh, dream 11 dream 11 so this is a classic example of dream 11 so you participate in this with x amount of money so with this gst because today there is no definition of goods or services the concept is of supply so interesting question arose and the state of karnataka issued notices to these kind of gambling companies which ultimately led to a uh, uh, high court decision in karnataka saying that the activity you are carrying out is a supply and therefore you are liable to pay tax at the rate of initially that the rate provided was 18% so this is 18% tax is to be paid now i have been told there are two components of it if today you are participating by making a particular team and you invest and you play for 100 rupees 100 rupees is split in two components 10 rupees go towards the platform company or dream 11 it goes to and 90 goes in a prize pool and 90 is being over a period of time let's say there are 10 lakh people playing one game 90 is collected and distributed among the winners depending on what the scheme or what the game is and 10 rupees into 10 lakh what the number of participants those are shared the issue arose that all right we are paying gst on this 10 rupees because this is a platform we are charging when the other money is going in a pool which is the larger pool for the distribution to the winners and we are not liable to pay government said that no for us this 100 is 100 and therefore we are liable to pay 18 rupees now look at the situation the platform is getting 10 rupees whereas total amount if invested is 100 rupees tax rate is 18 so he is supposed to pay 18 but he is collecting tax 8 going out of his pocket he said how what kind of rationality is this but anyhow that was did not the issue which was taken they said that the activity we are carrying out is neither gambling nor betting but it's a game of chance sorry game of skill and game of skill is not covered and betting and gambling means game of chance it's not a game of chance so karnataka high court looking at 1957 old judgments what is the difference between a betting and gambling said that this is an activity of uh, skill and activity of skill is not covered in the service and supply and therefore they quashed all note notices which have been issued over a period of time the government got vigilant after this so they expanded the scope and what is going on currently which is a burning topic is they said all right we are coming with the definition of online games it can be any type of game whether it's gambling or not gambling because we are not living in 1957 interestingly if we read a 1957 judgment when they differentiated between a gambling and uh, horse racing 
they went to morality and rig veda saying that the gambler's wife do not come back home they don't come back so they took it to that level to say it's a pernicious or it's a rest extra commercial it's sort of immoral trade which you are carrying out that's a logic which we picked up in alcohol also judgments we have seen over a period of time it's a rest extra commercial you can't have a right article 19 in this and all those things which were there but over a period of time because it has shifted today we have multiple online it's a very big industry casinos are there online are there betting are there so government in after this karnataka high court said that we propose to enter a separate category called online gaming and all types of gaming irrespective of a chance or skill we will include everyone and we will charge tax on 100 not on the 10 and 90 component i will charge on 100 and at the rate of 28 because it's pernicious now this has created a furor in last 4 weeks because i don't know if you if you pick up a newspaper in last 2 weeks you find that gaming companies are saying we will not operate uh, because we 28% i retain 20, uh, 10 rupees you ask me to pay 28 how do i pay that so that's a one logic they have killed that logic of chance or the uh, gambling betting versus the uh, uh, skill games which are there they say it's we are treating this one entry as online and therefore we'll do it i've been told some during last two weeks there was a gst councils meeting they have agreed a to carry out an amendment to include online gaming in this and second on a valuation that we'll charge value on 100 and not 10 so most of the online companies casinos who are operating in india they will fail this industry will shut down so the there is lot of representations which have gone to government i think gst council meeting is proposed in next two weeks to consider this aspect one very interesting aspect i read today in economic times was lot of foreign countries uh, they realize that gaming is a very big industry they are inviting foreign companies the indian companies to set up their servers and the so called gaming company outside india and on server you are sitting in india you can play on that that therefore the entire revenue from india goes to the company outside india and the gaming you play what how does it matter to you on your mobile the server is located outside india or server located in india where it is uploaded where do you play like a channels we receive all the sports channel you receive are uplinked in hong kong so you receive in india where do you concert but i think the if we closely look at law there is a provision where the place of supply can be legally defined so they can define a place of supply where the consuming the services there can be one element to it that brings in the issue again a constitutional issue can there be extra territoriality merely because on the extra territoriality of that which mean that you can't challenge the validity of law purely because of extra territorial nature and we have faced numerous instances i think very famous judgments of alai lili and justice kapadia said that if it is the territoriality which is bringing tax in india it is extending to uh, to outside a person uh, earning anything outside but is by virtue of his nexus which is resident business connection permanent establishment anything it can be taxed in india so the permitted extra territoriality but the domestic law is there and our constitution say it can't be invalid so i don't see even although there was a very big article in economic times that this is one way to which can be done the second aspect is where now what i believe is that most of the industries have reconciled and they want to play on is to say that if they survive on their first principle argument that please charge tax on 10 we are willing to pay which is 28% of 10 2.8 but you can't charge on the remaining because 90 goes in a pool i'll distribute it among the winners and why would you do it so that's the gambling why i refer to the gambling is because this is the very very live topic which is going on you open any newspaper and you will find something or the other and the role of gst council can in indirect taxes in india the state's legislative competence can be dependent on the recommendation of a constitutional body which has been created it's certainly a deviation from the uh, the uh, constitutional taxation framework we used to have that the you straight go the state will make a uh, list two subjects the uh, center will do a list one and that the bifurcation was very clear here it's coterminous coexisting co concurrent powers have been given on same transaction so which is a very very remarkable change in last 70 years in pc in a tax structure and gambling being a hot topic that's why i raised it <coughs> last is the equalized levy why again said equalized levy it has got also something of extra territoriality or linked with this the again this came through the finance act in 2016 which adopted the provisions of income tax act which i said that it was settled in uh, by justice chandrachur senior in his judgment saying that finance act is also an extension of income tax and the powers are drawn or the field is drawn through the uh, entry act 2 and therefore the chargeability can be there 
though initially it was that any indian resident carrying out any expense or making any expense on account of advertisement which is to be carried out in any part of the world which is online then that amount which has been paid by let's say today the godrej says that we want to advertise particular thing outside india and this is to be uh, whether it is received in india or not but this 100 rupees godrej is paying to the advertiser or to the channel or to online platform or to anyone 6% of that is to be retained in india in law the onus was cost cast on the person who is making the payment that is godrej and government said this is equalized levy because the anybody who is earning out of india must suffer tax in india at the same time if that person who is receiving is located outside india he was not obligated to comply with the indian law but the onus on a by creating a reverse mechanism said the person who is liable to pay please pay 6% which mean that if you want to advertise your let's say legal services outside india if it is permitted at some stage you will be paying you say that the 100 rupees but ultimately the the receiver will not agree that you pay in 94 by deducting this so the your cost becomes 106 and not 100 so that becomes a big issue but they suffered on that realizing that this worked over a period of time well although the multiple countries uh, uh, with india because india has two set of international obligation through two, two treaties briefly i'll talk about that they objected to it but i think later on this was uh, agreed that these kind of entries can be made under the uh, the multilateral arrangements india is is member of 2020 came in a bigger picture where they extended not only to advertisement expenses but any online purchase or sale of goods which mean that as the example i gave if from amazon you are buying something goods are coming from outside amazon is also outside india if they are not present in india still you have to pay 2% on or you, know, you means the person who is actually buying online you have to pay so this was called equalized levy the objective was that if anybody is earning out of india even if you are not present that should suffer tax that's a broader idea was that and they came up with this concept to equalize levy so why i pointed to these two instances are that the tax structure is always very flexible and courts have said that the once there is a source under the constitution to tax something the entries or fields which are given cannot narrow down that scope if there is a not in a direct uh, a field available to you if it is a ancillary field if it is adjunct field still the a validity of that taxability cannot be seen on account of the uh, the field being narrowly defined the entries being narrow that's a constitutional provision which is being there so these are fringe things which we are talking of like the somebody could have easily said that it is a gambling and i'll not pay tax but the way the constitution structure has been amended today if it is online gambling is covered therefore end of the matter it's a part of gst it's a supply therefore chargeable tax so thus can equalize again the person who's outside india can say very well i have no nexus i have no permanent establishment i am not resident why are you taxing me so the how the route has been used is we will not tax the person who is receiving but since the money is going from india you are earning out of this money by selling something or by Uh, 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 putting advertisement somewhere, government devised this mechanism and used this way. We'll charge equalized levy. So nobody can say this is not. A I mean, one logic can be that it is not tax on income because income is the person who is receiving the money; he is earning it. But that's where the flexibility, which has been given to the, the interpretation of the constitution, if we see of the period of time, you can't restrain. And this being challenged, the, the validity was challenged, but later on withdrawn of the equalized levy. But so that's the tools which are the. Uh, constitutional tools which have been used two more important aspect which are extremely relevant in case of direct taxes <coughs> one are that the we called it double taxation avoidance agreements these are dt double as we call that so government has entered into almost close to 70 dt double as with the multiple countries the object is that no income should be charged to tax twice or double taxed which mean that if a foreign company or let's say a foreign actor comes to india he is performing something in india but his home country is outside in the outside india is a us or players come in in a company's example can be in multiple ways they have no presence in india except the performance which they have done 
Indian government will say by virtue of a provision in the Income Tax Act, the person who is making payment should deduct tax. So if the Indian government has deducted tax on money which is to be paid to the performer, performer goes to his home country, whatever the money he will receive, he will declare in his taxes and he paid. What will happen to this tax which has been deducted? So the, by virtue of this double taxation avoidance agreement, the provision has been created that you can get an offset or of the uh, benefit of this credit which has been deducted and this is the inter-country arrangements which have been done. These are the smaller level example. But largely we, what we see uh, through these treaties is that on no transaction there should be double tax in two different countries. There should be credit available, there should be at one place. And key provisions which are there in these cases are that any payment which has been made by Indian entity to a foreign parent company or foreign related party in the form of royalty, fee for technical services, all those are tax deducting provisions are provided. Treaty rates are generally lower than the tax income tax act provided rate. This has also become a very big issue that what will happen that if the treaty rate is low and the domestic rate is higher or the treaty is exempting from tax or not charging tax but the Indian Act is charging to tax, how do you apply this? The understanding was very clear which is inbuilt into our municipal law that is Indian Income Tax Act section 90 that which is more beneficial which is either the, the, the DTAA provision or the Income Tax Act you take the benefit on the SSC this option was given so that person can claim and this led to one very famous uh, a case uh, which we uh, call Azadi Bachao in this case, issue came that if the home country says that we are, it was in India Mauritius double tax avoidance agreement, if saying that on sale of shares or sale of assets, if Mauritius is not charging tax, can India charge to tax? They said, no, if, you, if the government of India has agreed to a particular treaty, please don't interpret it like law. It is an agreement between two countries and you have to honor this agreement to that country. After that, there are numerous judgments recently, I think in 2017 or 18, just Rowington said that in these international obligations, the municipal law should be read in line with that commitment which India has given and that's what we see 253 in article where the Indian government has got. So that has been prevailing over a period of time. One other international obligation where India, we have seen lost numerous arbitrations is, which is called bilateral investment treaty, uh, BITs we call them. Although India has uh, waived multiple BITs as on today, they have been drawn out of BITs because of some few specific instances. Generally, the bilateral investment treaty is signed between two countries. It is to protect the investment which has come from one country to other country. And the basic principle is that whatever the protection you give to your own investment, please give the similar protection to the foreign investment which is coming. Just a broadly which is this. If you are damaging anything or if you are <coughs> expropriating anything of the foreign investment in any form, then they are, the foreign investor is liable to compensation or damages and the route is they go through the international arbitration that even and India has on by, by virtue on tax, account, tax and other things and interestingly the first case actually came up, came uh, into everybody's knowledge of white and white, uh, white, white industries. <coughs> so white industries and interestingly the how the expropriation was came, a successful arbitration execution enforcement pending in India. It remained pending for 11 years in, in uh, Indian courts, including Supreme Court. On this ground to say that I am unable to execute this, the proceedings were initiated. India lost the international arbitration on this ground. The protection has not been given to a foreign award which is not enforced in India. Those are the kind of obligations of the treaty which have been uh, given. So these are bilateral investment treaties are extremely important. So broadly, if you look at these aspects from uh, economic legislation standpoint today the tax collection also is not confined to the income which is generated in India if it the India is linked in any form that may be residence that may be source that may be underlying asset that may be something transferred from India in terms of ownership every country will try to expand their base and since the flow of Human resource and capital is so easy today. Look at the stock market in last four, if you look at in last four months, we have received something like seven, eight billion dollars which have been invested in this. So this money will ultimately will go back. So flight of humans and capital will result into these kind of issues and every country try to maximize their uh, the uh, taxes which has been or revenues which out of these kind of transactions. This will happen. So 
I don't think that these kind of laws can remain static. These would change with the change of time. And I think the classic example that why our constitution is an organic document which grows with time. It is to take to shape depending on the society. It is to take shape on the economic environment, in the journal environment. It to be interpreted in that form. These are classic ways we can see that why these kind of laws are need to travel with time. And second is no sovereign nation can remain aloof in the geopolitical or economic political environment today. They need to have some kind of alignment with these. And these are the tools, DTAAs, which are the examples of this. BITs are classic examples of this. As on today, possibly we may see it from the point of view that India has lost the BITs uh, and we look at it from this point of view. What happens if India, Indian investor is invested outside India? They would be seeking the same protection in the investing country where they require. And these are the ways which can be practically can be done over a period of time. That's the broad overview from my side which is there. I'll be very happy to uh, answer any question uh, which is there regarding these aspects. <coughs> Thank you very much, sir, to enlighten us, honestly, I mean, it's a very new subject for till now. 2015 onwards, till date, we have not discussed this at all. Last time, Vishwanath ji has given some inputs, right. uh, and we, this copyright act, so that we initiated, luckily, immediately uh, accepted, we are highly grateful. If you feel the more you want to enlighten our members, as far as we are convenient, part two, you can address it, anything. So we still, see. we want to learn actually, honestly. Uh, so all no, I can understand. Uh, the, this is very clear that these are not the areas which generally uh, <coughs> any court practicing lawyer would on regular basis would keep track of it because ultimately as we live by brief. So what if the client comes to us, a brief we represent, the court is done. These are more our regularity required in these areas and that's why we see this. these specialists are emerging in different practice areas. Like I understand this area because I've done over a period of time. But all I can advise to the young lawyers is that it is extremely important to have one strong, solid base area where you know the subject extremely well. And you will find that the way uh, I see the economic situation of our country emerging in next year, 10 years, you will find the very, very different kind of legislative challenges coming, starting from data protection, starting from uh, cross-border transaction, starting from we have uh, the national security, uh, internet, uh, I think the changes which are coming in the IT Act. We have uh, the uh, Competition Act which is made cross-border, that is to be changed. So these are the areas which I understand that generally not being of uh, use to the Supreme Court going lawyers, but I still, the young lawyers must focus on these kind of areas because I certainly see a great scope for the lawyers in these kind of practices. Uh, tribunals are emerging which are very very highly specialized super tribunals are there we have a competition tribunal used to be there now it's a part of NCLAT where the competition appeals are going after the competition appeal we have electricity tribunals which are highly litigious area and the high value litigations are there we see that the tax tribunals are there we have the IP boards which are there so I certainly see that it is always beneficial at least for the younger generation mm -hmm. lawyers to focus on the one or two areas where you can, over a period of time, develop your strength, uh, develop knowledge about a particular area, and you will find <coughs> that there certainly those kind of a disputes in times to come as the things are changing. We land in the higher courts also, as I see today that the areas which 10 years back I was practicing the tribunal not in the electricity tribunal or the tax tribunal, all are there at some court. So it's, it's extremely important to acquire a solid knowledge about one or two areas where you can claim yourself to be specialist rather than be a journalist. Means that's what my such a suggestion would be to the younger lawyers. Yeah, first we'll go for word of thank, then we'll question answer. Aditi, please come. On. Aditi will give word of thanks today. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, very engaging and engrossing. Uh, 183rd Friday group meeting subject, which uh, the timing of it seems perfect because we all have been battling and trying to understand our five sources and heads of income in this <laughs> July as the deadline draws near. Right. What's also wonderful in today's discussion is um, about how you have simplified and broken down the history, the etymology of the law, as well as some of the burning issues, which for the best of us, uh, we'll find ourselves at sea amidst <coughs> Section 2, Part 10, 
third proviso and ninth proviso. Oh, that's right. I, I don't expect that even for that. Thing. That's the reason I say that it's extremely important in these kind of practice areas. You need to spend more time. And uh, as young you as you are, it's better you, it is that you get control of the matter, the subject uh, that way and then you can get into the productive litigation that can you, I mean from a career standpoint also I, I certainly see that being a, rather than being a journalist is, is better to be specialist but as I said it's, it's you need to take a call at a young age if you have option. Yeah. So with uh, perhaps your guidance we can all have a better understanding and get better grips with the subject. Um, thank you Seishu sir for giving us this opportunity to be part of this very enlightening discussion and this Friday group which continues our legal education which is inherent to all lawyers and uh, thank you to all the members here for being part of today's discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we'll go for question answers. Any questions please? Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, please. Mm -hmm. that we are using this complicated tax uh, system. Instead of that, if we can use uh, single uh, tax or expenditure tax. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, uh, you know, this is a question which has been debated multiple times. And I think JT Saab was the right man who possibly could have answered this question to this. This has been raised uh, multiple times that the expenditure, uh, if you straight away start taxing the expenditure, you don't need to struggle with all this. Just go to a point of expenditure and start taxing it. You know, but these are larger policy and uh, the governmental decision. So if you, you today have created so many laws uh, this department is performing multiple functions. Means, just to give you an example, it is not only performing the function of income tax department. Uh, black money laws are also uh, uh, administered by this department. The certain prosecutions are being done by this department. So, I would say this is a larger policy issue. Like what you have seen today in indirect taxes, we don't need to apply sales tax. We don't need to apply central sales tax. We don't need to apply manufacturing and excise duty. This is all shifted to one area which is called supply but it took I can tell you from 2004 today we are almost 20 years this kind of idea in a federal structure to take shape took 20 years income tax is far more complicated whether we admit or not there is still very sizable part which is not in the income tax net so that creates its own complication for these kind of but uh, this uh, this is not a new suggestion this has been there but Generally, till now, the parliament has not reached a stage to take a decision on it. That's what my understanding is. Uh, yeah. We'll give the opportunity to someone. I will file on 2005. After that, I will not file. That's completely yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> our prerogative. <laughs> Yeah, any questions further? Sir, we are winding sir. up. Yeah, please, Rahul, please. Thank you, sir. And thank you for the enlightening lecture, sir. Sir, I have a question regarding the PIT then MIT. Sir, as you mentioned the case uh, of uh, Vodafone case in which the Indian government made some retrospective changes and in the white industries case uh, where the ICC award was not enforced and uh, ultimately we faced some changes, sir. Do you think that uh, the 2015 BIT model that India is like applying in uh, future BITs and MIT, would it make any difference? See, I think the, the model which has been suggested by Government of India after withdrawing out of multiple uh, BITs has not been accepted by other partner countries as on today. And primarily the reason are twofold. One is that Government of India in the model draft has excluded tax as a uh, dispute of uh, BIT which means that the if by in relation to any tax consequent or tax exp expropriation, you can't take this to uh, under the BIT to international arbitration. Second is there is a concept of MFN, Most Favoured Nation Most Clause, favorite. which means if you have entered into treaty with, let's say, Malaysia today, and you are giving more favourable terms to Malaysia, which you have not given to other treaties which you signed before today, which means let's say 20 treaties being signed, all those 20 partner countries can claim the most favoured nation clause which you are entering into with Malaysia. So the government is want to move away from MFN as one of the clauses in this, but ultimately why MFN is present and if you leave aside the India treaty with the other countries but and you look at the treaties which are there 
let's say between uh, US and UK. And you will find MFN clause in almost there because and, yeah. and the national treatment also. National yeah. treatment also. Yes, so correct. In the national treatment clause also is there. So if we are unless we agree to this, it's going to be challenging. Although we have signed two or three treaties with small countries, but we have not been able to sort of bring uh, it on a bargain table where we can sign treaties with a larger country. So I see it challenging for. Uh, is it challenging to convince the Western powers? Yeah. It will remain, you know, it's all because all these are bilateral. Yes. We sit on a table and two of us agree or disagree. And as on today, possibly the one reason I see um, the treaties are required more by the countries who are investing in India. Because we have not reached a stage where the Indian investment is going outside more. We are still the larger recipient of investment in India. So the threat to that investment can happen in India. That may be one incentive where the larger investing countries may look for that some kind of protection to their investment is required. But, it, you know, these are <coughs> hard bargains. These required uh, diplomatic ties which are appropriately to be used. Some soft power skills and soft power is being used before we enter into. But these are a matter of negotiation largely. Thank you, sir. Aditi, you want to ask any question? Please. Kavya. Thank you very much, sir. We will take your autograph. Oh, please. <laughs> you say next day. So, thank you, and I'm extremely privileged. Thank you very much for giving a chance to be thank here. You. Thank you.